it's uh, such a pleasure to be here, and it's been a pleasure to be able to uh, have been able to follow the conversations uh, in this room and in the workshops for the last two days. Uh, so I don't know whether I've been uh, I've, I've, I'm better prepared than if I came with nothing, but at least I um, I think I can maybe relate a few of the examples I have to some of the topics you've been discussing. Um, I wanted to start actually with with a, um, a quote uh, that relates to innovation, and um, it was triggered by my drive up here with uh, Tim Burton uh, on Sunday. Beautiful drive, and he mentioned that Alberta is a bit of a maverick state. Or maybe it's Tim. Uh, and I wonder, you know, coming from a, from a different culture, actually, I'm both a U.S. and a Danish citizen, but still, maverick is not a word I use that often. So I wondered, what is what is a maverick? And I looked on the internet and I found this definition by Aretha Van Herk, who's an author. And it says the following: A maverick is a unique character, an inspired or determined risk taker, forward-looking, creative, and eager for change. And I thought that was a pretty good opening statement concerning innovation. Because innovation is about change. So what I'll share with you today are uh, some ideas and practices, and concrete methods actually, about uh, how to work systematically with innovation. Most of the examples I'll share with you, the case examples, will not be taken from the recreation field. I think maybe one will. Uh, but hopefully, you can still relate some of the points and some of the examples to your own practice, at least I hope so. And why do we need innovation? As many of the other presenters have touched on the last few days, we're in a bit of a perfect storm when it comes to the challenges facing public services and probably social or societal services in a wider sense. I usually say that that perfect storm is uh, well, it's a perfect storm because it actually consists of not one storm, but several systems of storms, several storms colliding. And it might look beautiful from the top, but it's not as pleasant to be inside one. And some of those different storm systems are, for example, demographic change that we've talked about, technological change that on the one hand is marvelous because it offers all these new technological opportunities, but also it can drive up costs, it can pose new challenges and new demands on us from citizens, for example. In healthcare, Technological change is both a double-edged sword. On one hand, it's uh, of course helping us cure uh, treat, uh, with, with cures and treatments we didn't know existed before. On the other hand, it drives up healthcare costs massively. Another component is, is often mentioned is the demands of citizens. Citizens have never been, at least in a country like yours or a country like mine in Denmark, have never been more and better educated than before. Uh, never had that kind of access to information online. And so they have everything they need to be more critical and to be more demanding of what we do with them or for them or to them. And finally, when I've been reading the news the last couple of days about what's going on in Europe on the financial crisis or the economic crisis, when I listened to the news this morning about Canada with a revised projection for GDP growth next year going down from maybe 2.6 or 2.9 to 2.1, not that the economy is the most important thing necessarily, but still it means that resources are maybe not as available as we wish they were. So that's another important component of this turbulence and this storm we're part of. And that calls for innovation. I'll just share with you a case example of what I believe is innovation is about and that might hold some, some lessons we can, we can use. And this is taken from a related field, but a different field than yours, taken from uh, care for older citizens in Denmark. I'm on the jury of uh, local, um, the local governments, the National Association of Local Governments, Innovation Awards in Denmark. And last year I had the pleasure of being part of the jury that awarded the, uh, the national prize for the most innovative local government project to this project here, uh, which was called uh, Live Longer in Your Own Life. And basically, it was about uh, the fundamental challenge we have in Denmark of how do we provide increasingly low-cost care to older citizens in their homes. Helping them with cleaning, with daily chores, shopping, also with personal uh, hygiene and so on. And in the municipality of Fredericia, in the western part of Denmark, the management and the director also of the health services and the care services asked this question. How might we not just think about this problem as a problem of being more efficient and throwing 
cheaper and cheaper services into people's homes, how might we turn the equation around and maybe invest in people's ability to get by on their own again? And with this shift from cheaper services to living longer in your own life, we undertook a radical program to invest in all the kinds of welfare services, physical therapy, physical training, uh, uh, sociological or uh, psychological advice, uh, various kinds of social work, to basically give the older citizen a bit of a public service shock. This is a photo from the project or from the operations of that program, where all the workers from the different silos of government go to the citizen and draw up a plan based on what that older citizen wants to be able to do again in her life. Like, for example, being able to take the train to Copenhagen to visit her grandchildren, or to be able to walk down to the grocery and shop for herself, rather than have to have someone do it for her. And the outcome of this program is pretty remarkable, because, well, first of all, older citizens felt this was much better for them, because it improved their quality of life to be able to do things again. And 50% of everyone entering the usual care program in that city with this program would get on on their own without any help at all. Another 35% would get on with less help from public services than they otherwise would have had. And only 15% needed uh, the typical uh, care. And for the 35%, by the way, it was mostly cleaning and some of the tough, tough, more physically straining jobs that they couldn't take care of themselves. So as you can imagine, that's, all, that's also a cost saving for uh, the municipality and for the local community. Uh, and I'm also going to show you how it looks in terms of both the health benefits and the cost uh, saving there. So this is the, uh, the top line, is sort of the, the, the regular cost of care and uh, the longevity of the average longevity of people in the program. And this everyday rehabilitation program, Live Longer in Your Own Life, basically shows how the cost on the left side in the Danish corner, uh, one, it's about five Danish corner to a Canadian dollar, how that doesn't start to rise until later, which means basically that people are fitter and healthier for a longer time before they enter into more intensive care and finally into hospital. And um, the municipality of Fredericia shows the shift in practices like this. Some basic components where I'm thinking is that actually uh, physical fitness and uh, recreation is, is part of this equation. And to me, the reason that this is an innovative program is that we both have a situation where citizens receive a service and experience it as a better service than they had before. It generates better outcomes in terms of health, and it generates savings. I'll get, get back to what I believe are the bottom lines of the types of value of public sector innovation, but these are some of the concerns. So, at MindLab, the organization I run, we're part of three state or national ministries in Denmark, so I'm a public servant. And top left is the Ministry of Employment, to the top right is the Ministry of Business and Growth, which is now called, and the bottom left is the Ministry of Taxation, we have a separate ministry for taxation because our tax level is so high in Denmark, we need someone to go for that. So, it's up to about 63%. Up there. What we do, or what we say we do, is to co create to tackle wicked problems. How many of you know what a wicked problem is? Hey, a few of you know it, but most of you don't. So I, I want to share with you because I think actually what most of you work, go to work to do every single day is to tackle with you wicked problems. A wicked problem was defined back in the late, late 60s and early 70s by various scholars, uh, most notably in an article by Rizzo and Weber uh, for the reference. Uh, 1973. And a wicked problem is, first of all, a problem where whether it's a problem or not is disputed. Just like, for example, with climate change. I don't know how many people still dispute it, but some do. Or in Denmark, we've had a long political debate about whether immigration is a problem or not. If immigration is a problem, in what way is it a problem? And to whom? Or what parts of immigration for other countries is a problem and what parts are not a problem? So that was point one. Contested, what kind of problem is it and is it a problem at all? Secondly, it's a problem that has multiple solutions. 
as we know about climate change, as we know about creating more employment, as we know about health, these are complex problems with multiple solutions where none of them will, you know, have the, um, would be, be the right one. But where probably it's a mix of different types of approaches or solutions that might work. And thirdly, we will never solve them. These are problems that never go away. Will we ever have a day where we have as much equality in society as we want, or as uh, much well-being, speaking of which, or as much uh, environmental sustainability as we would like? Probably not. But of course, the reason that every one of you go to work every day and try to deal with these types of problems or challenges is that we can hope we can get better. Just a little bit better, or maybe even radically better. Which I think actually they did in Fredericia in the case I just mentioned. They got radically better at dealing with the challenge of care for older citizens in that city. So in my lab, we're a physical space, we are workshop so, and my team and my staff are about 12 people with backgrounds in design, ethnography, sociology, computer science, communication, and a few sort of really old school, boring types with political science backgrounds, like myself. So we have designers and anthropologists that are paid public servants that work to assist other public servants who usually are lawyers and political scientists and economists and so on, helping them innovate. And we use this physical space to do it as a platform for collaboration between those three ministries but also beyond those three. And we do a lot of field work to go outside the silos and look at what is actually going on. Like when we looked at how government regulation and red tape impacted how farmers like this one experienced, well, government bureaucracy across all the different silos that were affecting this business. Well, we would go out and investigate what it's like, this is a bad picture I'm afraid, but uh, you can still see what it's supposed to look like. Went out to investigate how young Danes um, dealt with their financial situation and financial literacy and what it would mean to introduce uh, new knowledge and understanding of uh, smarter financial behavior in schools. So what I want to talk about is first of all, what is this idea of innovation in, in, in public policy and in, in public services? And for that matter, in societal services, social services uh, we can think of. Secondly, I want to stress that I believe very strongly that to innovate in a way that works for people. We have to co-create solutions with them, not for them. I want to talk a little bit about the opportunities that I think that you as a community might harvest. And this is basically, that is pretty much based on what I've been listening to the last few days and sort of in the, in the framework I'm talking uh, about. Uh, what might be the opportunities for you? And finally, I'll talk a little bit about the leadership challenge and all of this. So this is just a very simple definition of innovation. New ideas that are implemented to create value. And in a society, of course, there can be individual value, but often it's value for society uh, in a wider sense. And of course, there can also be a discrepancy there. Um, what is value? Well, most of us are not in the business of making a profit, or at least we're not only in the business of making a profit. Uh, we run public services. Uh, we try to govern, or we try to help politicians govern. I usually say that there are four kinds of value that we need to be concerned with when we innovate in public policy. Productivity pretty much goes without saying. Can we do things smarter, do them for less? Okay. What is the service experience that we're delivering, or creating, or producing with citizens, or with businesses, or with local communities? What does it feel like to be the recipient? Or how does it feel like to be engaged by someone on behalf of government? Well, we went out and investigated government bureaucracy and red tape. When we investigated financial literacy, or many of the other projects we do at my lab, we are not so interested in how many citizens think of what about government. We don't do surveys. We don't even do focus groups. We observe. And we try to understand what is the meaning that people get from engagement with government. So that's what I mean by service experience. We can certainly use surveys to, to, to address that question too. I think one of the great questions asked today in this forum was uh, to ask uh, communities 
or as citizens in this country, uh, what they love about the community? I think that's a great question to ask. You can ask it qualitatively or quantitatively. Probably be interesting to ask it qualitatively because then you can follow up with the question of why is it that you love that? Or what can we do more to make it an even better community for you? Outcomes. Outcomes are ultimately the good things we want to create. In my new book on leading public sector innovation, uh, the subtitle is called Co Creating for a Better Society. And what is a better society? Well, in my mind, it's certainly a better society is one where we get more of the good outcomes we want to achieve. Health, well-being, it could also be economic growth. It could be entrepreneurship, it could be employment. Uh, it could be all those things, it could be more trust. And we have to think about whether we are working hard enough to understand how those outcomes are created. I think there have been a lot of excellent presentations and contributions these two days about uh, the linkages and the complexity of creating outcomes. Finally, democracy, I believe, is a very important part of innovation in a political context. We can also innovate to increase participation, empowerment, transparency, engagement. Those are also things that are critical in a democratic society and that we can innovate around. We can find new ways of engaging. And the point around these four types of value is not that uh, we should choose to pursue just one of them, but the point is that to really radically innovate and to reframe or transform, it is really about shifting on all of those three or four even uh, types of value at the same time. It's not very difficult to increase productivity if we don't care at all about the service experience. It's probably not even that difficult, it could even be difficult, but not that difficult to get out better outcomes if we had all the money in the world. If we had all the money in the world, we might, you know, just pay people for it, to, to take a job. But we don't. So the trick, the challenge, the innovation challenge, if you will, is to innovate in ways, identify new ideas, new models, new approaches, new paradigms, and give us more of all of these things at the same time. And actually, the case I opened with, Fredericia, gave at least some, something on three of them, maybe even four, and they engaged citizens in deciding their own programs, so how might they live longer in their own lives, that's a democratic issue, that's certainly also a service experience. An older sister told me, uh, one of my project managers at MindLab, that the only time she really felt at home in her own house was at night in the evening when all those care workers had left the house. And she was in her own home on her own. So for her, it was a good service experience that they stayed away and let her and help to get, regain her fitness so she could do these things on her own. And outcomes where we saw the health outcomes there. And uh, by the way, productivity in that case in Frederick, they saved about uh, uh, two million uh, Australian dollars uh, just uh, the first year in a small community on, on uh, simply uh, not having to provide in home services, but the citizens could, could, could produce the service themselves. A lot of the conversations we've had over the last two days, I think, have been about um, exploring. Innovation. At least when organizations do it best, how about navigating between exploration and new models of producing or operating or exploiting resources? So, one way of thinking about this conference is that we all explore the mystery like detectives uh, to discover what might the future of recreation be like in Canada. And we may think we have a lot of the answers already, we may discover new ones. We may have a heuristic, we may discover paths, directions, we may even discover a new model, an algorithm. So Roger Martin from, from Canada, from Toronto, who uh, proposed this, uh, calls it the knowledge funnel, basically says that we need to, to innovate, we need to be able to navigate between operations on the one hand and, and, and you know, operating at scale and efficiency on the one hand, but also to shift to exploration when that's needed and to understand and delve into the mystery of what are we even doing. And because we're dealing with complex, wicked problems, we regularly, I think, have to look into the mystery of what are we, what's even going on. Working with innovation in, uh, in public service is a lot of fun because it's really difficult. And actually, I would claim that it's a lot more fun than working with innovation in private companies. First of all, in a private company, it's just that one bottom line, do we, are we making a profit or not? We have, have at least four different types of bottom lines. But also, we work in a political environment, and we can pay, have to pay a price for that, in terms of risk aversion, in terms of uh, short-term agendas, in terms of power play, in terms of, many of you talk about silo 
silos, the world silos are not just produced by bureaucracy, they're also produced by competing political uh, ambitions. Anti-innovation DNA, well usually I say that many of our organizations are not top two innovation machines. They're not like the Google of public services. Uh, we may have work to do in terms of rethinking organization, more flexible, maybe matrix-based organizations, um, using more cutting-edge organizational models, perhaps. Fear of divergence, I sometimes call it the fear of the post-it note. Fear of writing something on a, on a yellow post-it note and hanging it up on the wall and something that might be crazy or wild, an idea that may even not be possible to realize. It's something that many public servants find difficult. Uh, I mentioned to uh, one of you uh, yesterday, I think, that uh, we sometimes might not run an exercise for a group of public servants where we ask them to say something that is not true, that is obviously not true. And they find that very difficult. But we have to practice divergence of ideas to span a wider potential, a wider possibility of action. So we have to practice living and being comfortable with divergence, even if it's just a post to Where's the citizen? Sometimes, at least at high level policy making, but actually also sometimes in the very front line of public services, we don't see the citizen, we don't see the person that we're actually there to serve. We become blind because we're professionals and just doing our jobs. I'll give you some more examples about that later. But we have to think about getting the citizen, getting people in the center of how we innovate, how we do what we do. An orchestra without a conductor, some people, people have already talked about orchestration uh, as a way of uh, thinking about uh, new processes, uh, innovation. But where's the conductor? Who knows how to, how to conduct this orchestra? Do we have the skills and competencies within public services to, to actually systematically work with innovation? I'm not so sure. And finally, we talked about metrics or measurement today. My experience is that we have extremely poor measurements, at least about what really matters, which is often outcomes. So we lead into a vacuum where we don't get feedback about whether we're doing anything that works or not. And often, you know, we might as well be doing more damage than harm. We don't know. We just do what we do. We get up every morning, go to work, go home again. We've done something. We've been busy. But what have we changed? And the 80-20 rule a bit of a provocation, but I think we spend about 80% of our analytical capability, of our thought capability in government, to look to the past and evaluate, assess, run major research programs about how things went in the past, and the reports always arrive like a year or two too late to have any relevant policy making anyway. And we spend only 20% of that much looking into the future building scenarios, looking at forecasts, but also looking at creating the futures we want, building the visions that we want to pursue. And we actually don't have much of that skill set. The last 20 years has been dominated in public policy by evaluation, not very much by foresight or innovation. Maybe a provocation, but I think there's something to it. So strategically, uh, working strategically with innovation, is to be conscious about creating the future you want for your organization or for your community or for whatever your constituents are. And uh, I would say that there are at least these four different ships happening pretty much at the same time, at least in some organizations, some spots on the globe, that are showing the way where we might want to head if we want to work in an intelligent and also a very concrete way with innovation. I've summed up those shifts in my, in my book uh, as the four C's. I have to, it has to be something with C, apparently. Seven C's, four C's. I don't know. It has to be something with that, I guess. But it's not so advanced, so it's just four. I'll spend most of my time today speaking about co-creation, but just to mention that I believe you need to build a consciousness or an awareness about what innovation means to us and what it means to work systematically with it. I also think we have to build the capacity, the, the skill set and the uh, cultures that allows innovation to flourish and to be led and to be practiced. And we of course have to show the courage to lead innovation. I'll say a little bit about that, about leadership. But co-creation is the practice. And Actually, I think that if 
if you start doing things differently, probably you know, culture will follow and leadership will be demanded. So maybe we shouldn't you know, talk so much, maybe we should just start doing. And I experienced very much that this is actually a room full of doers. So perhaps, maybe, what I've shared with you might be useful. So involving citizens is about creating ideas in a process of exploring the mystery that will have a better idea of working for them, a better possibility of working for them, than if we didn't involve them at all. And you might say, well, I'm a citizen too, I use the services we provide myself, my family uses it, but it's not the same. In my experience, we have a very hard time stepping outside of our professions. And we have to make an effort, I think, to step into the shoes of citizens and experience what they experience. Even if we believe we know that very well. It's almost always an eye opening And I think we need to do it to move to a paradigm that's been mentioned a few times also over the last few days that is about co-production. Discover ways in which we can really truly engage with stakeholders, with users, with citizens, that allow them to bring their own skills and their passions and their motivation and their energy to the table and to take part in the creation of those or the produce production of those services. Any service, and that's most of what we do with services in public policy and public service, is an interaction. There are two parties. We often tend to forget that. So, how might we think more about that relationship and that transaction and interaction that's going on in any kind of service? And the way to discover that is to co-create. So co-creation becomes the first shift we need to make from an expert-driven innovation culture and in government to a, a co-creative culture, and then we might get, we might explore and find new models of co-creation. So I define co-creation as a systematic process of creating new solutions with people, not for them. And to me, there are the, at least these three different components of it. Broader scope of people, new types of knowledge, and a different kind of process, which means a different kind of doing and action. Now, those were each of those, uh, those three points. So, broader scope of people is about consciously involving more people, more stakeholders, particularly end users, citizens, and doing it sooner than we usually do. So, I'm not talking about consultation when we sort of thought everything through and we're putting out some kind of very fine document for people to comment on. I'm not talking about town hall meetings or hearings. I'm talking about very early exploration of what might work with people. Not necessarily everyone at the same time, but certainly a lot more than we usually involve. An example was that when we at MindLag were asked to uh, help build a new strategy for climate change in Denmark, that at the same time helped businesses see new potential and grow as well. So it was a business strategy for climate change. We wanted to have the cake that needed to, we wanted both to, pr to reduce CO2 and also generate more growth. We involved the five or six departments of central government that were that had to coordinate this. And that was a bit of a challenge because as you can imagine, the environmental department probably didn't have the same take on this as the Ministry of Business, as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as the Ministry of Climate Change. Oh, and the Ministry of Finance, which usually just sit on the sidelines waiting until they can just ask the whole thing because there's no funding. <laughs> and what we did uh, for a series of workshops in Copenhagen in December, and December in Copenhagen is actually even darker than it is here in, uh, in October. Uh, it was pretty dark, and it was pretty early, and we brought in this group of about 18 senior officials from, from all these different agencies. We used a variety of methods to get them to collaborate and to get a common ambition. And one method we used was to involve an artist. Uh, an artist, a Danish Icelandic artist, his name is Olaf Eliasson, and he has produced one of the most successful exhibits, for example, at the Tate Modern Gallery in London, where this is taken from. It was called The Weather Project. The Weather Project was really about putting an artificial sun in a gallery and letting people experience it. He also worked with the car maker of BMW on climate change projects. And he actually pretty much froze a BMW or made a BMW out of ice.
nice kind of things. We put it in the uh, San Francisco uh, Museum of uh, Modern Art. So we got hold of him to share his artistic and aesthetic vision and speak about climate change, speak about subjectivity, speak about experience, just to somehow frame for these public servants what we're talking about and get a different kind of connection to the issue. It also became pretty concrete at the point, and this is actually two years before the uh, infamous Copenhagen summit on climate change. And he said to the group, well, I have the sense that you're so excited about getting that climate change summit to Copenhagen that you don't know what to do with it. And the room got pretty silent. And the outcome wasn't that good either. Actually. When we looked at the ideas generated by that group of people over two workshops in 2007, and we compared it to the final strategy that came out two years later after all the involvement of ministers and politicians and as in consultation with stakeholder organizations, 80% of the ideas and suggestions that were, the, that, uh, were in that document were produced at those two workshops. One trick we used, by the way, was to take away the silos and take away the hierarchy in a group when we generate ideas. How do you do that? You do that by making the process anonymous. So we asked, we gave everyone a laptop computer, and you can enter ideas. Nobody could see who was entering what. And you had the magical moment when somebody from the business ministry was building on an idea from somebody from the climate change ministry. You brought knowledge and insight and expertise to play around a vision, around a strategy, where it didn't matter where the idea came from. And at least in my country, it actually usually matters who said what and where you are in the hierarchy. That didn't matter for those, uh, that idea generation process. I'll get more back to the question of end user involvement, but people are all of these and probably a lot more. And we have to think consciously about who we involve and how. And how we even sometimes provoke uh, a group to uh, get a higher level of ambition about what they're going to do. Now, you might be saying if you skeptical, thinking a few skeptical things, and here's a Q&A on that. Uh, maybe one of the things you might be thinking is, well, you know, we can't involve everyone, and people will expect something in return for spending their time and involvement. Not necessarily. And I certainly think that, and that's probably also your experience, that if we ask citizens to contribute, they almost always step up and want to take part, because they feel it's important to help develop public services and public policies, because it's actually part of citizenship. I've never experienced that citizens won't take part in an innovation process. So, professional empathy. How do we try, at least, to understand how people experience what we do to them? And how do we use that as a way of driving new ideas and innovation? That's what I call a new mode of knowledge because it's a very fine-grained, qualitative knowledge we're talking about that we need and that we don't have, I don't think, sufficiently today. Some ways of involving citizens and some ways of getting our knowledge into play. We can talk about involving a lot of citizens to gain knowledge, or a few. And you can talk about involving citizens with different purposes. Two different purposes could be, for example, understanding what is going on today or creating a new future. And as this model shows, you know, we do a lot of surveys. Surveys will tell us how many think what. What are people's opinion? Or how many are satisfied or not satisfied? But surveys, not, they almost never tell us what to do about them. So surveys are actually terrible at helping us innovate. The only good thing they can tell us is how big is the problem? What's the burning platform? We need different tools and methods to begin to understand what are people actually doing, how might we do it differently, so we need to shift to involving people through what I call qualitative research, ethnographic research, observation, shadowing. Somebody mentioned yesterday uh, photo voice, that we call it cultural probing, it's a bit the same, asking people to document their everyday lives through photo photographs or statements, text messaging, and just sharing that with us as the researchers. And to create a new future, uh, somebody already mentioned crowdsourcing, so how might we on the internet, for example, ask hundreds of thousands of people to contribute with their ideas? We can do that. That's often a little bit of a 
challenging exercise because we get too many ideas, we almost can't handle it. But you can crowdsource for solutions, for ideas, by posting very specific, succinct challenges or questions, or calls for ideas on the internet, and you get feedback. Private companies are doing it, and we're seeing more and more public organizations doing it too. For example, an organization called the Australian Centre for Social Innovation posted uh, on the internet, but also in the print media, um, a, a social challenge saying we're looking for the best models that can tackle tough societal issues in our country. Who has any answers? They, got, they put out an award, usually there's an award involved or, or, or a reward involved, uh, one million Australian dollars, just to make it interesting. 240 applications, most of them done with video to be very concrete, uploaded to their website and they chose eight. And each of those eight got a donation and were supported in capacity building and to scale and spread the model. One of them that I loved the most, and I actually spoke with the founder uh, in Melbourne, it was called Hello Sunday Morning. Any idea what Hello Sunday Morning might be about? Alcohol abuse, exactly. Binge drinking, young Australians apparently drink a lot on the beach. Hello Sunday Morning. Trying for the first time in a lot of years to experience what a Sunday morning look like, looks like. <laughs> that was the name of the organization, and the concept was actually to, to uh, not drink for six months. And the founder tried it himself once, and he said he got a lot of new friends. He also lost some friends, but he got some better ones. <laughs> Hello, Sunday morning. So that can happen with crowdsourcing. Finally, the way we work at my lab is we involve citizens and stakeholders, but certainly end users in workshops to try to discover what might work for them in practice. I'll show you some design methods to use. But you can involve citizens in smaller groups to try to create a new future with them. One example also from the Australian Center for Social Innovation is called Family by Family. I've mentioned this in my workshop group, just to share this story briefly with you. So designers and anthropologists, or so, uh, sociologists, worked with uh, uh, families at risk uh, in Australia, they're called the chaotic families, in Adelaide and South Australia. And in this project, there was also a project manager who was actually a seconded from the family administration in the, in, the, in the city. And the purpose of the project was to try to discover the mystery of why is it that family services don't work? And how might we actually make an attempt in this wicked problem of chaotic families with drug abuse or alcohol abuse or violence? How, is there a different way than taking the children away? And the reason, that, by the way, that the Australian Center for Social Innovation chose this topic was simply that it's one of the most wicked problems around. And there had been a 50% increase in number of, uh, of families and number of kids uh, placed in foster care over the last, I think, six years in Australia, at least in South Australia. What they did was simply to start living with the families. They had dinner with them, they went out with them, they interviewed them, they video filmed their daily lives with their permission, of course, and began to explore what is it that matters to a family in crisis. And it turned out, interestingly, that actually when a family gets up in the morning, it doesn't ask itself, how do we avoid that public services take our kids away today? It's actually not the first thing they think about. What they think about is how do we become a thriving family again? How do we combine? And how do we get more of the good things in life that we want? And this project based uh, its approach on something called positive deviance. Positive deviance is a, was a theory to practice that basically states that there are always, always someone in a certain, certain group that are doing some of the stuff we want everyone to do. And actually it turns out, of course, that there were families in Adelaide that had been through tough times but gotten out on the other side. Same socioeconomic background, same kind of uh, education, same kind of challenges, but they managed and they got out and they were thriving. So what happened in the project was basically that they connected the seeking families, the families that were seeking help, support, to get into a more thriving situation, with the sharing families that could share their experience and be their mentors. And through this period of peer learning, and by the way, through a lot of recreational activities on weekends and camps and so on, they found a model where they could really, really make a difference and help shift these families into a much better uh, living. And one of the uh, outcomes was that 
numbers and they calculated, you know, how much, how many families might we help, could we help become thriving families again for the cost of removing one child. And uh, they could help about 200 families for the cost of removing one child from his home. The manager from the city of Adelaide was part of the project, was just astounded. She'd been a manager for 10 years in the family administration. Uh, Carolyn is her name. I've been to her a couple of times. Uh, and she said it was just incredible. And the fact that she had you know, managed and uh, decided to take even newborns away from their families when actually there was a different path, a different approach, was just astounding to her and very painful. And I think there's one point that is that when we start involving citizens in new ways or communities, it can be an eye opener, but it can also be quite painful because actually we can do things sometimes radically better and different. There's a link there for a video there on television in Australia. There's lots of material on the website you can take a look at. At my lab in Denmark, we did a project with uh, injured workers on behalf of the Danish uh, Board of Industrial Injuries. So they were interested in understanding what goes on and how much we provide better services for people with a, a serious work injury. When we interview in their own homes Danes with a work injury and video filmed interviews, they told us basically that through the uh, case management and services that the agency was providing to them, they were made more sick than they were already. 25 letters asking you how sick are you, what's your condition, doctor statements, all of it having to do with the case, all of it having to do with your condition. You become your illness. It's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Doctors tell me that they can't even give you know, pain relief to citizens as long as they have an open case with the work injury board. If they have the case has to be closed, insurance some pay, then they can start dealing with their pain and dealing with their situation. We ran workshops with these, took those video statements, those video clips into workshops with public servants from the agency. Pretty painful stuff because actually they didn't know. They may have had a sense that they weren't doing their job that well, but actually they were actually very, very good at legally handling the cases. Seven cases, all the documentation is in order, the legal quality is fine. They were pretty efficient too. But maybe they were being efficient at dealing with the wrong problem. They were dealing with the problem of how to manage a case and to pay out insurance sum while citizens actually wanted to get their lives back after work injury. And maybe even a job. Okay. So now we're working with that agency to help them make that shift from highly efficient case management to helping people get a life again and a job again. And actually get a thriving family. One of their approaches is to help provide psychological assistance not to the person with a work injury but to the spouse. Because when that person with injuries is whining all day, lying in bed, not working, not taking care of the kids, actually the marriage breaks up. We're working with insurance companies to pay off the mortgage for the family until daddy gets a job again. By the way, the insurance companies have money to invest because if they invest in that, maybe they don't have to pay out as big an insurance sum because of lack of work with them. I'll get back to more about this, about the resources that we have available. We also work with foreign workers in understanding what makes quality of life for them in Denmark. And uh, let me just play a short uh, clip from uh, Sarah up here. We interview a number of workers about what's important to them. Uh, and um, this is an Indian engineer who uh, works for a major medical company, a uh, medical biotech company in Copenhagen. And he's one of the kinds of people we want to stay in Denmark. So let's see if we can get this sound clip running. So we use sound quite often also because it's, it's also anonymous. Uh, I mean, it can, can be anonymous. We've had this, this uh, agreement to play this. Uh, and it's just about a one minute clip. Okay, so this is... This is a small kid in a different country, in a different culture that is, uh, what I would say, is a big challenge. And as an example, uh, when my second kid was born, and we would like to choose the name that is best fit for what we find. But um, I could not give the name of my child the name that I want. I need to choose uh, uh, the name uh, from the list. That was a big problem. I want to call it Zuhair, uh, but that name was not in the list at that time. Uh, I ended up with choosing him Zidane. In Denmark, we have a list of approved names. And we don't have any Indian names on the list. So he 
says, raising a small child in a foreign country is a big challenge. And he actually thought to himself, when we as a country denied that he could give his son the name he wanted, he actually thought about leaving the country. He didn't do it, and now he says maybe he should have. That's just one little tiny, tiny, tiny thing. But we played this back for a group of high-level policymakers from five different ministries that were charged with finding ways of attracting and you know, he's keeping foreign talent in Denmark. And our charge in my life was just to help them see and experience for themselves and connect, show their professional empathy with the people we want to stay. And as they tell us that it worked, they're beginning to generate new ideas about how to keep South Africa in the country. So, are the limits to this kind of work and this kind of quality of knowledge, maybe? Um, here's some points, Q&A. We're not that interested in what people want. We're interested in understanding what they do and how we might help them do more of the good things. So we're not holding up the microphone asking so much for ideas, we're more asking ourselves what is actually going on and how much it make things different for them. Finally, rehearsing the future is about using a design-driven approach to co-create. And I'll shoot, run through this a bit uh, uh, quickly. Um, Herbert Simon, who was actually also the father of administrative scientists in many ways, said this about design in a book called uh, uh, The Sciences of the Artificial. In a way, you know, we are all designers. Some of us, however, are probably, you know, some people are better at it than others. And if we are engaged in designing services, what does that mean? For example, it means that we did in Denmark, uh, this was another prize for the local government awards, to give adult mentally handicapped the tool to document not just their everyday lives, but their dreams in this institution in Odense in Denmark. So that, for example, one lady who had pretty much no spoken language, just a little bit, she articulated that she actually loved the garden, even though she spent all of her day inside, and had done that for 20 years. The way she documented it was by photographing, just giving this cultural pro photographs, just took photographs of her, what she wanted to have in her life. And when the professionals saw that she wanted to be in the garden, they were like, of course, we can make you the garden, we'll, put you in, we'll work in the garden now. So just that example actually helped make an entire shift in that institution from being an institution that was having people work there and where the professionals determined what the work was going to be to letting the adult mentally handicapped define their own work. And today the professionals are say that they are the innovators. The adult mentally handicapped are the innovators who are defining activities in the work. And they've had a 300% increase in, in use in that institution. British Health Service uses design to innovate, design thinking, they talk about experience, space design, and they look about what is the patient experience, and try to use the patient experience as a jumping off point for creating better services that are meaningful to people. An example from recreation in Copenhagen, and uh, how many of you know the concept of Nudge? Some of you, if you know. So Nudge is about designing the choice, the architecture, or the conditions for people when they make choices. For example, the choice of taking public transportation, or the bicycle, or the car. Uh, and the uh, philosophy behind Nudge is a book called Nudge by two behavioral scientists uh, from Chicago, uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard uh, Thaler. And, um, this idea of being conscious about how we design, for example, like cafeteria, so that the salad is first, the bad stuff is a different place, all of things being equal, we'll take more, more salad, less of the bad stuff, can be applied to many different areas. For example, in Copenhagen, we built a whole new recreational area around some of the fortress, fortification of Copenhagen. And on the website, where you can uh, look at this beautiful new thing and you can decide when you want to go there, you can also get directions. Now, a nice principle is to think about the choices uh, that you make available to people and the order in which you make them available. So the first choice you have is not the car, it's how to get there by bicycle. The second choice you have is how to get there by public transport. And if you really, really look tough, hard, then you can maybe find how to get there by car. So what are the, what are the choices that we make available to people? And in this case, uh, they were very conscious about nudging people, getting a little bit of nudge, to take more of the stuff, transportation kind of we would like them to take. Design is really about balancing two attitudes when we think about creating desirable futures. You say it's left brain, right brain. 
balancing analysis and synthesis. Best designs, whether they're services that are, or it's products, are integrative. And in many ways, I hear that recreation is an integrative discipline. Maybe it's a design discipline in a way. We have to be balancing those two dimensions. And my experience in government is that most of what we do is on the analytical side, on the analysis side. Where we split things up and put them in their different parts, we don't integrate them. Design is also about action, it's about challenging, it's about thinking about how people would engage with a design, whether it's a product or a service. So it's a human discipline, it's an, uh, also an artistic discipline, it's about meaning, it's about experience. And first of all, it's the process of designing is experimental. Rapid prototyping, building something, trying it out, getting feedback, learning, trying something different that might work better for people. So designers and design discipline has something to offer to us in terms of how we drive process innovation. And especially because it's so concrete and it's tangible. Designers always do stuff, create stuff that's tangible. Or even services that are well specified and explicit. It's also a process, design process, where you use a lot of uh, visuals. Uh, for example, to prioritize ideas as we do here at MindLab. It's about visualizing service journeys. You don't, you're not supposed to read this, but this is the service journey of that injured citizen. 25 letters, six different agencies. What does that feel like? The green flashes are points of pain, where things break down and are meaningless to the citizen. We can redesign that process. If we visualize the process, we can redesign it so it becomes more meaningful and a better experience. Just a couple of minutes. We can prototype new solutions in a storyboard like this. Just a story of what might a new design look like. We can video film a design prototype with stick figures in a workshop. You can role play a new service. These are students from the design school role playing a climate change policy. I don't remember what exactly it was, but they were pretty enthusiastic about it. And you can map system resources over time. This is a mapping of, it's in Danish, I'm sorry, but this is a mapping of all the different agencies involved in a work injury case. The citizen caught them all the way in the middle. Limits to design? Well, we may create expectations, but they can be managed. That's the basic point. We may create solutions that people expect us to implement tomorrow, and we'll have to say, well, that's probably a political decision. But if we manage expectations, it can certainly be done. One minute left, uh, just to say that some of the value of co-creation is to understand what is the potential of innovation, how might we actually in practice realize that potential in quick changing things, and how might we shape better outcomes. We've heard about going very close and moving far out. So it's actually about the movement to being extremely fine-grained about experience, but also being extremely systems-oriented about what is the system that's generating that experience, how might we reconfigure that system to co-produce better results. And the opportunities I thought that were for you could be something like this. Grab the well-being agenda, place yourself centrally in it. Think about the practices that are really the glue that keeps communities together. Finding new ways of tapping into those resources, even, as I mentioned, people that we think are the weakest in our societies, like a governmentally handicapped, might have something to contribute with. They might be the innovators. How might we engage them? And I think, as we talked about in, in, in my workshop, that there's a creativity argument, too, that we can actually push forward in terms of saying that recreation can contribute also to the economy, and that seems to be needed as well. Last 30 seconds. is of course to ask this question to get started. And I think to get started, to build platforms, to build practices, we need leadership. Leadership is about being willing to take the consequence of insights, for example, in transforming an organization like the Danish Work Injury Board when they see that they're making people more sick than they're already. And that means leading change, and that can be tough because people will question why is that change necessary. And it has to have the courage to say, if we don't do this, we're dead. Not necessarily physically dead, but maybe we're mentally dead. You can read more about all of this um, in my book. And uh, I put some folders outside that you can take a look at. Thank you very much for your attention.